Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Today is January 1st, 2021. We have gotten past 2020. And when I ask myself, who would I want to start a wonderful new year with? Only one name came to mind, and that is Frederica von Stada, who joins me today from California. I'm in New York. Flicka, welcome. Thank you, Fred. It's a Christmas present, a late Christmas present to see you. So good to see you. I, I'm thrilled. Um, I'm never at a loss for words, but where do I begin with Frederica von Stadt? I think I know. I remember the first time I saw you perform. I was 14 and you were not much more than that. And it was at the Metropolitan Opera and I went to see Mozart's Magic Flute. My father took me and I didn't know that I was seeing Frederica von Stadt because you and not for the first time or the last were playing a little boy. This was really a little boy. This was one of the three genies in the magic flute who float above and they sing and they guide Papageno on his way. And these were incredibly formidable genies. It was Gail Robinson, Judith Forrest, and you. Uh, since then, the Met has used really little boys. But at that time, there you were. Nikolai Geta was Papageno and Lucia Pop was in it and Herman Pry. And the reason that I attended this performance was I was studying with Herman Pry, And he wanted me to come because I was studying actually the Papageno arias and that's he true. wanted me to come. So that's how I didn't, I didn't know I was going to see you, but I did. Um, that now, was your Met debut in 1970. Now, do you know, can I tell you why they used girls instead of boys for those those years, because it was the Marc Chagall uh, decor, and we did come down on a uh, uh, a bench from way above the proscenium and had to wait up there for quite a long time. And apparently, when they used kids, um, the boys <laughs> would throw things down on the stage or spitballs and things like that. <laughs> so they thought. We can't deal with this. So that's how I got the job. <laughs> a spitball. You had been in the National Council uh, competition and Rudolf Bing heard you and offered you an audition and you were engaged. And I went to look back at the year 1970, just the year 1970 and what you sang there. It was January 10th of 1970 was your debut. So we're talking 51 years ago. Yeah. And um, a few days later, a month later, you were in La Fanchula del West with <laughs> Renata Tabaldi as Wow Clay, who is the Indian, the Indian woman, the squaw, who speaks only in infinitive verbs. She doesn't she doesn't conjugate her verbs <laughs> to make her sound ignorant. And nowadays this would not be acceptable. Right. But <laughs> you Singing with Renata Tabaldi and basically being her housemaid uh -huh. and keeper. What what was what did you get from Tabaldi as a professional? Well, you know, when she would come into the opera house and in those days, Fred, as you know, there wasn't all this glass and protection and, and it was it was very homey. It was very it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um in so she would come in with her lovely gal that helped her and her dog, her poodle, and this beautiful, beautiful gold jewelry and her marvelous face and a fur coat and hat. She was the true diva. Um, the whole house was talking about it. Everyone, stagehands, anybody. The, the you know, stagehands, the most important people in the house. Oh, yes. um, so it was very, very exciting. But I remember very specifically I had to zip her dress before a part of the a part in the opera where she had a really beautiful high note to sing, and she was a wreck. And I can remember um, it's a, it's near a line where she says, "Hey, mie scarpetti," and she would reach into this drawer in the Wild West and pull out the most 
perfect pair of Italian shoes, perfectly <laughs> dyed to match her costume. I, I mean, who, who couldn't worship her, frankly? Who couldn't, you know? She, it was so exciting. And, and it was Fausto Cleva, I think. Yes. Who conducted, yeah. And Sandra Konya. That's so right. That's right. This, this was like med school because then you were Flora, which is a step up in La Traviata with Marilyn Niska and George Shirley. Uh -huh. And then you were in Romeo and Juliet, the French version as Stefano, one performance only with Franco Corelli and Jeanette Pilou. That's right. That's and right. And so here you, Nicolai Guetta, Herman Pry, Lucia Pop, Renata Tibaldi, Sandra Konya, uh, George Shirley, Marilyn Niska, Franco Corelli in two months. And then you were the shepherd in Tosca. In Tosca, that's right. With Gabriele oh, Tucci, Richard Tucker, Gabriel Bacchier. And then big step up, Niklaus in Le Conte d'Offman with Nikolai Guetta again, Rary Grist, Rosalind Elias, Pilar Loringar. These are not only legendary names, but these are all role models, I think. Oh, oh I'll, I'll tell you, it was heaven you know just heaven i had funny stories on almost all of them um i got a little too aggressive doing the sword fight as uh not tobaldo as stefano. stefano and i think i nearly removed uh corelli's finger in my fight <laughs> and remember there was a wonderful instructor at the met then who said it's like i think you need to just don't take it quite like you have to give every inch of your power to this sword <laughs> fight. <laughs> um, oh my, I, you know, and, and when we were cover artists, cover Mario artists then, we spent most of our days that we weren't rehearsing in the hall, in the uh, opera house, listening to everything. And I, I, I went to everything. I went to every rehearsal I was free for. So talk about a great education and I had no opera in my background so it was I didn't right. when I went to school I didn't know who Mozart was how's that you know well then you were in one of my very favorite operas the role of Bercy in Andrea Chenier with again Carla Bergonzi exemplar yeah. of Italian style Renata Tibaldi Anselmo Col Colzani and then um you were knocked down a few pegs in terms of the size of the role. You were a flower maiden in Parsifal. Um, <laughs> Helga Brilliot, Krista Ludwig, Thomas Stewart, yes. and Cesare Sieppi. And we're still in 1970. And you conclude the year in La Petticol, not as La Petticol, which you would later do, but as Virginella and Teresa Stratus was La Petticole. With Terry, our beloved Terry, yeah. Yeah. I'm just turning off. That's okay. Sorry, I just have to turn off my iPad. It's dinging. That's okay. Oh, so I'm, I'm going to mention then that after that, you were one of the unborn in Die Frau und Schatten, Leonie yeah. Riesenek, Carl Byrne, Krista Ludwig, um, Lola in Cavalleria Rusticana, Fiorenza Cosotto, uh, Mercedes and Carmen with an all-star cast, uh, Sibel and Faust, Raina Kabiavanska, Giorgio Tozzi, Franco Bonisoli. And I mention these because this was kind of like your training ground. Yes, it was. And as you mentioned, you got to hear and see. Was there any artist who really affected you and struck you among those from that first year? Oh my gosh, I can't. I'll tell you who really struck me, and it was because of a funny incident. It was in Flora, and, and I did it with one cast that was, it, it was Sutherland. It was Joan who was doing the, the, the lead, and in one of the scenes, the, the third act, I think, or wh whatever the, the big scene is with the, the whole company on stage, I was standing behind her, and you remember, I don't know if you remember, the costumes at that time were magnificent. I mean, I had a Boucher painting almost embroidered on the front of my costume, but I had this very glamorous bracelet and I was standing behind Miss Sutherland and it got caught in her wig 
<laughs> and so in the middle of singing, I had to say, Miss Sutherland, um, I think if you don't mind, don't move because my hand is stuck in your wig. Um, and if you move, could you move slowly so I can walk slowly <laughs> beside you? And she was, she burst out laughing. I mean, <laughs> it was hysterical. I had many instances like that. But Fred, I'm so grateful to you for taking me down memory lane because I just feel so blessed. Going to the Met was like going to your favorite place in the world. It was safe. It was welcoming. I knew I knew most of the stagehands. I knew mo many, many people in the orchestra. The backstage crew, Nina Lawson, Jimmy Pinto. I mean, they are like my heroes to this day. It's interesting. I was going to go to the topic of, of what we call Met Family, and specifically Nina Lawson. Nina. Oh, Nina Lawson Nina. was from Aberdeen, if I remember. Aberdeen, that's Aberdeen. right. <laughs> and she was very no-nonsense. Talk about Nina Lawson. Oh my God, I love Nina. She, first of all, she was the most organized person I think I've ever met in my life. And making these wigs was extraordinary, but then delivering them to the heads that they were to go on was also extraordinary. And I used to, I, I wrote to her for a while when she retired and went home, and I really missed her. And she was just an extraordinary artist. I, I wish the public at large could know how many people it gets to get an artist on stage. There was another wonderful lady who's, because of my memory, I can't remember, Rosie. And Rosie was tiny. She and her daughter were the costume they, they took care of the costumes. And you'd see this costume walking along, you know, down the corridors, and you couldn't see anybody was holding it because Rosie was very, very tiny, you know? So it was, what a group. And Jimmy Pinto, my God, Jimmy Pinto made my life. You know, what did he do? The dearest soul in the world. What did Jimmy Pinto do? Jimmy was makeup. Makeup. You know, and he was always, if you had a nerve in your body and were, you know, like this, it was gone by the time he left your room. He was just extraordinary. I, now that you mentioned Rosie, there was another very tiny costume person, it must have been a job requirement, whose name was Arlene. So much so that Kiri Takanoa referred to her as Little Arlene. And... <laughs> Arlene did a lot of the darting and fixing for Curie's things outside yeah. of the Met in addition. But I remember occasionally seeing a dress move along backstage, <laughs> but you know, it was Arlene underneath the dress holding it up. <laughs> that's, that's what it was with Rosie. It was just fantastic. Was such, you know, and the only food you could get at the Met in those days was a closet on stage right. And they had coffee and hot dogs and some sort of, oh, I can't remember, you know, croissant or something like that. And uh, when they finally built the beautiful canteen on the second floor or second ground, below ground. You level. Level. I, um, I invited my daughter's entire kindergarten class to the dress rehearsal of Hansel and Gretel. And it was my, it was, my daughter's birthday is the 24th of December. So I have this party there so that the cake that is ground into the brand new rug that it was then <laughs> was my responsibility. <laughs> um, that little coffee bar, which was sustenance for all of us, it was not like a fancy modern. No, no, it was, a it, was, it was a closet, wasn't it? It was a closet. Um, the guy who ran it was a wonderful Latino guy named Freddie. Yeah. And Freddie made Cuban and Puerto Rican coffee, a local brand in New York called El Pico Mas Pico. And it was delicious coffee. And it yeah. kept hundreds of Met employees going when there was nothing else. Completely, completely. Yeah. Yeah. And that also was the place the loading dock, not for the scenery, but for the animals, would come in and out right there. And often I'd have to work the load in for the horses for Carmen or Cavalera Rusticana or the dogs for Rosen Cavalier for a different right. show. 
and all of the animals would come in and immediately their heads would turn to the left for the smell of Freddie's coffee. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, even all the horse right. in, in Fanchula for Miss Tibaldi. Yeah, <laughs> all of which really tells a story that it's a term we hear about, but you and I were fortunate to live, was the Met family. It was a family. As you came through the door, remember Winnie? Um, Winnie. How are you doing? You know, oh, it was it was glorious. It was just glorious. Winnie you know, was the receptionist and she, um, UC Beerling died in 1960. She never got over that. That was her favorite. Yeah. And while she was not supposed to show, show favoritism to any artist and she didn't, we all knew that God was UC Bureling and then there were all these wonderful artists. Yeah. And part of the experience of Met Family was that um, all of us who worked there obviously loved and admired a particular artist in a particular way, in addition to loving most of you. But it was our job not to reveal that and not to show favoritism. Yeah. So I never have revealed my favorite and I never will. She knows who she is, but <laughs> <laughs> and you know who she is, but <laughs> yeah. but um, basically, the environment was such that you could go down to the canteen and B level, yeah. and the rule was if there was an empty seat, you sat down, so that if a chorus member saw a seat next to Joan Sutherland, the chorus member would sit next to Miss Sutherland. And this meant a level of mixing and, and stagehands and Nina Lawson, I don't think ever ate, but everybody oh, else. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she probably just had tea and toast in her room. And it was, but, and, and you know, the canteen, I, it was fabulous food. You well, know? I had a role in that. So thank you very much. It was, it was not, fantastic. it was not always fantastic food. And I, when I came in, I just decided we have to fix everything. Yeah. And oh, the food great. got much better. I, I love real, you know, buffalo. That was buffalo, me. Buffalo. Yeah. I love the canteen. Well, you know, one time it was 1985 or 86. I took Sophia Loren down there and we cooked eggplant parmigiana in the canteen during a performance of Lohengrin. Now, now the story comes out. Placio Domingo was singing Lohengrin and he invited Sophia Loren, Woody Allen and his then partner Mia Farrow, Al Pacino, Susan Strasberg, and they all sat in a parterre box and Sophia, oh. after 10 minutes, asked to see the manager and she came out and she said, um, how long is this opera? And I said, well, Miss Loren, it's a wonderful opera. Um, <laughs> and it's four and a half, five. And she said, what? Ma non è possibile. I said, si è possibile. And I spoke to her in Italian. Ah, ma tu parli italiano. So we began to speak in Italian. She said, yeah. oh, fame, I'm hungry. And I said, I have an idea. It's a very long opera. My wonderful assistant will take care of this performance and you and I can go cook. And we went down to B level. It was closed and I opened it up. And yes, it was mozzarella. That's what made me think of it because I had it in and yeah. tomatoes and eggplant. And I cooked with Sophia Loren. She in a beautiful red suit and high heels. Yeah. And after the performance, I had to take her backstage to see Placio Domingo. And great actress that she was. You remember Stanley Levine, the stage, uh, stage of manager? Of course, of course. Stanley was 100% gay, but nearly fainted with lust at Sophia Loren <laughs> and followed her with a flashlight to lead the way. And he said, I would change everything for you, Miss Loren. And, <laughs> oh, <laughs> and we that got is to, such a good, I love that story, Fred. We got That's to Plasso's dressing room and he said, oh, Sophia, I'm so happy you were here. She said, Placido, you have no idea what a wonderful time I had tonight. <laughs> he said, thank you. And she said, you're welcome. And that was it. That is great. You've got to see her new film. I plan to, yeah. It really Madame was. Rosa, based on Madame Rosa. Yeah. I plan and, to. And her, I've worked with her son it, when he conducted our Eduardo theater. or Carlo? Carlo. Carlo. 
Okay. No, wait a minute. Say the what's the first name Eduardo again? Eduardo and Carlo. Oh, Carlo. Carlo. Okay. Yeah. Um, and he is adorable. He's the nicest person in the world. He's a and conductor. He and I think they made the film together. They did. Yeah. So the thing is, Met Family. I, I don't talk about current times because I don't work there anymore. But in the era when you and I were there, it was incredibly special because we were doing live broadcasts on radio every Saturday, TV broadcast, not HD. Right. And um, the artistic level, I won't say every night, but most every yeah. night was quite stunning. And we got to see other artists and other craftspeople, and in my case, stage directors, because that's what I studied, who were outstanding. And it was an ongoing education. And that's what I loved about working at the Met. Yeah. Was how much I learned. Oh, absolutely. Um, and then there was, remember the tour? The Metropolitan Opera Tour, when we go on tour? Well, I only did one tour. I did the last one in 1986 because I was responsible for the opera house while all of you were on tour. Yeah. And I went to then general manager, Bruce Crawford, and I said, Bruce, for my life experience, I need to know what the tour was like. Yeah. So please send me out on the tour. And he did, thankfully. And it was, please talk about the tour and what that meant. Oh, it, Fred, you have no idea. It was so much fun. Um, the Met took, in those days, was it Eastern Airlines, or I can't remember, mm -hmm. um, and they chartered two planes. So on the plane, um, very often, Sir Rudolph would be going up and down the aisle serving everybody, <laughs> which was hysterical. Um, we all stayed sort of nearby each other in hotels at, at different levels. At my level, I was always sharing a room, I think, with Gail or somebody, and it was so much fun. Um, one of the sweet things that comes to mind is something that uh, Tibaldi did, and that was in Cleveland, she had a fan who was a, a very senior citizen and very disabled, and she lived in Columbus, and she would pay for her way to come to Cleveland every time she was on tour, and then a group of us, and it was Jimmy Pinto and myself often, and we would look after her. We would take her around and, you know, be sure that she got to all the performances. And in those days, in Cleveland, it was in this huge arena. So if you had a front row seat, you were maybe a quarter of a mile away from the stage, you know? It wasn't really opera at its best in that regard. Um, but there she was, and I, I can't remember her name now, but I, uh, she was adorable. And we used to look after her. Um, the tour was hysterical. Our absolute favorite place to go was Atlanta. Because most of us stayed in Atlanta, and I've, I've driven by it in the years since. It was an old hotel, it's probably gone now, but it had a pool, and oh my God, I remember Bob Merrill and everybody really relaxed a lot, a lot on tour. Um, and, you know, the Southern hospitality would come upon us. And I remember going to one dinner and they weren't going to let me in because in those days I was skinny and they thought I was maybe one of the ballet corps. And uh, so I didn't qualify to get in, but I got in and I sat next to, to Mr. Bing. And I was terrified, you know, um, how do we talk and how, you know, and what do I say? And, um, on the other side of him, he had this marvelous Southern bell. He said, oh, Mr. Bang, I'm just so very happy to see you. And oh, please have another, oh, mint juleps and nothing. They're just, just, just good. They're just a warm up for the evening. And then by the end of the evening, and I don't think it was the mint juleps, he was singing. He was really? singing Schubert songs and Schumann, Schumann songs, and it was one of the best moments of my life. But we used to go, I used to go out to lunch with, um, um, with Luciano, and he, you know, Luciano had that habit of 
could try a little of what you were having and what everyone was having at the table. Um, you know how opera singers are. They're third graders out on, on a bus tour having the time of their lives. You know, it's, I loved the tour, just loved it. And all the people that you met and the, the donors and you realized how expensive it was to, to get it together. But it, I think it meant a lot to all the communities, and most of the communities have established their own opera houses since. Well, that's actually a very important point. And for listeners who don't know, the Met was founded in October of 1883 at the old Metropolitan Opera. And that very first year, it went out on tour around the nearby places like Brooklyn, because believe it or not, Manhattan and Brooklyn were different cities then. Right. And therefore, to tour to Brooklyn was a foreign visit. And they went to Boston and very frequently to Philadelphia and Washington, and then began to expand to other cities. Yeah. And even at the late 18th, 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, they went to California very often. And in fact, the Met was in San Francisco in 1906, the day of the earthquake. Really? And it was a huge financial loss for the Met because at that time, I don't want to make up a number, but at least 20 different productions they brought with them by train. And they would have a residency in San Francisco. Almost all of the productions were destroyed. And Enrico Caruso was there and he was he liked to do caricatures and he drew San Francisco, which was which burned down, frankly, because after the earthquake, there were fires. And he did drawings of that. And then he hired an oarsman in a little rowboat that took him across San Francisco Bay to Oakland. And that's how he escaped the fires and the earthquake. And, really? and he wrote in his memoirs about that. And so the Met was the national opera company because the only other permanent opera company didn't come until 1920. And that was Cincinnati Opera and then yeah. San Francisco Opera in 1932. This is not to say that there was not opera in cities like New Orleans and Chicago and Milwaukee. There was, but there were no permanent companies apart right. from the Met. So oh, that's how I, the oh, Met Fred, traveled I'm everywhere. That you know that. And certain cities became favorites. And among them were Atlanta, Cleveland, Boston. Memphis. And Memphis, Minneapolis. Memphis was more darn fun than you. Oh my Lord, did we love Memphis. Why did you love Memphis? Oh, it just was that, again, that Southern, and it was warm, you know, and yeah. after Boston and Cleveland, and it was always, it was still, I don't know what time the tours were, maybe. They were May, March? June, May and June, really. Oh, they were. Well, yeah. it was still cold in Boston and Cleveland, so when we got to Atlanta and Memphis, it was, Oh, it was heaven. And you know, I was doing roles like, that's it, that was my role. <laughs> Don Carlo. <laughs> you, just, you just heard it. Um, so I could party. And I can remember <laughs> nights when I was crawling home, I, I'm ashamed to say. And oh, we, we just had such a good time. One, my one big claim to fame is in Minneapolis, which I loved. Uh, Ruggiero Raimondi said to me once, Ay, Flica, are you awake later because I come and I sing under your window. I sing you a song just especially for you. And I said, oh, Ruggiero, I'm on the 43rd floor. <laughs> 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 but that was my one big romance <laughs> with Ruggiero. <laughs> um. In my experience, the greatest Don Giovanni. And I've oh, seen many, many, and there are many wonderful Don Giovannis, but he oh, really had it all for that he, role. You know, he was trained a lot by this uh, extraordinary coach at Glyndebourne named Ubaldo Gardini. Mm -hmm. And I worked everything with Ubaldo. I just adored him. You would not get beyond the second phrase of anything because he'd have so many things to say about no, 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 no. So it was quite a process. But when Ruggiero first, the, his first time to Glyndebourne, he was misbehaving a lot. And, <laughs> and Ubaldo had to sit him down and say, 
you have to take care of your voice. You just <laughs> have to. And he agreed. I think I think Ruggiero must have been early twenties, if not. Yeah. Um, he said, "I'm I'm your designated nanny for your mother. Your mother told me to take care of you." <laughs> so. That was one of the great starts that he had, was with Ubaldo Gardini. He's from Bologna, and he's also a terrific cook. And the Bolognese meat sauce that I make that's in one of my cookbooks is his. And I acknowledge the recipe because it's that good. It's a classic, not made with lots of chunky beef, but it's made very subtly with a lot of milk and carrots and very little tomato. Yeah. because the carrots give it sweetness and the color and the milk softens the meat. It's a phenomenal thing. And that's, that's I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up. I'll what send it to you. Okay. Um, but uh, just a couple more things from that first year, and then we're going to move on. The women that you mentioned, two of them, Renata Tabaldi and Joan Sutherland, were of their era in another way, in that they traveled with their own costumes. And you were talking about Joan and La Traviata. She was a, a tall woman, and a lo not a heavy woman, but just large. But she was not well, heavy. Just, yeah. And But the costumes were made for her mostly by a woman named Barbara Matera. And Tibaldi had her costumes made in Italy. Yeah. And basically, no matter what color the production was, if Renata Tibaldi wanted to wear a certain yellow or gold because she looked good in it, as Tosca, let's say, yeah, that's what she wore. And the I companies just had to accept that in Sutherland. It was not about the colors. It was more about the fact that she wanted to have it fit well so that she could breathe properly and sing wonderfully. Right. But we, we don't see that anymore. No, that that and they were I mean, it was the same thing when Joan would come to uh, to the Met, you know, when she was there, that the whole house was a buzz. It was just so exciting. Oh, she's here, she's here. Same with Jackie, you know, it was like, oh boy. Carolyn Horn, um, yeah. And so that's what I, I mean, to, and Tabaldi was tall. She was, yes. she was big too. I mean, not, not fat, neither of them, but just, they were just big, big girls, you know. Yep. Um, I love that they travel with their own costumes. That's, that's the sort of the way it should be, but can't be anymore. You know. Well, there were, I remember once um, I met Elizabeth Taylor. I can tell you the date. It was, you don't forget this, March 22nd, 1987. Yeah. And um, I was talking to her about opera, and, and she was wonderful and gorgeous, a very small woman with beautiful eyes and just a wonderful spirit about her. And I said, uh, you know, Renata Tibaldi and Joan Sutherland travel with their own costumes and clothes. And I've seen pictures of you, Miss. Have and I said, I think fourteen or fifteen. That's all. I travel <laughs> twenty six. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be the wherever Elizabeth Taylor went. Yeah. Twenty six cases had to go with her. Well, and I bet. Uh, those times could never be again, but yeah. aren't we lucky that we knew them, you know? Yeah. That was that was the way, that was, I think, maybe part of the incredible respect for the arts and artists. And I'll never forget taking my kids to a um, circus when we, they were little in Germany. Um, and all of the artists in the circus were treated like artists. They all walked out of the tents in beautiful furs and jewels and you know there's a there's there was a great and deep respect for what they did and i love that i love that i got to see that I, i'm going to add not only see that but be that but be that but yeah. be that right yeah um so one more artist of that school uh, going back to the same era 1972 when you sang il rey in don carlo <laughs> Um, <laughs> Probably in the wrong place. The king was Cesare Schiappi, the Eboli was Mignon Dunn, the, uh, the Rodrigo was Robert Merrill, Franco Corelli was Don Carlo, and Montserrat Caballé was Elizabeth. And 
this is a legendary cast. Caballier didn't travel with as many costumes, but her she limited her costumes basically to black. Yeah. And, and just, she said to me once, she said, well, I'm Spanish. I can wear black. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember the black costumes in this opera with the little sort of uh, little black hat and the veil that came over. And did you work with, get to know her at all? I mean, yes, you were only singing Il Rey in that opera, but. No, I didn't, I, you know, I, and I was so smitten by everybody and, and fairly shy, but there's the cutest story of Miss Cavalle in San Francisco when she was there. And I don't know what I was singing, but I went into the opera house and, you know, a lot of um, artists who came from Europe when I first started in San Francisco Opera, they, there were no credit cards or anything like that or, or checkbooks. They came with cash. And she went to the rehearsal department at one point and said, you know, would you be kind, of, kind enough to um, cash a check for me or get me some cash? And they said, oh, yes, of course, Miss Cabellet. How much, would, how much should we get you said, let me see, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 3,000. <laughs> <laughs> and, and these kids, <laughs> they hadn't seen $3,000 in their life, you know? <laughs> Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, yeah, 3,000. <laughs> and you really captured her, her speaking voice yes, just now. She was so, I do remember her being funny, but I was laughing from a distance, you know. I she was incredibly funny. I, yeah. I don't know if people knew that about her. Yeah, very funny, very break funny. Break out laughing in the middle yeah. of, you know, La Traviata, she'd suddenly start laughing. And <laughs> yeah, and Mac, um, Bob Merrill, and um, I can only think of Mac. Um, great. Cornell great, McNeil? Like Cornell McNeil. He was his hysterical also yes. and i got to know that in atlanta sitting around the pool <laughs> <laughs> it's funny also, my my tour year i went to atlanta because i was told that's where i had to go but i guess because it was the last year ever of the tour yeah that it didn't have that it, people were a bit sad and yes they were living it up in atlanta but you could feel that everything was for the last time Right. And the tour got very expensive, number one. But number two, with the Met going to these different cities, many, though not all of them, developed local opera tradition. So most famously, Dallas. Dallas Opera 1957 began. And it's a wonderful company. You've sung there. I've heard you there. I don't know if you know that. Um, and it's a wonderful company. It's a city that supports opera and built a beautiful opera house. And Minneapolis, Minnesota, has a wonderful opera tradition. Somehow, Cleveland and Boston did not so much. Right. And Atlanta came later, but now it's one of the best companies in America. But it took a while. they're doing thrilling things, yeah. They're doing wonderful things in Atlanta. Yeah. And similarly, uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles were different because San Francisco built its own company in the 1930s. But... Los Angeles did not have an opera company until 1984. Just, yeah, I think it was just New York City Opera that went there, wasn't it? Would go there, time? and we have a beloved mutual friend who's going to be joining us later this month named Nimet. And you stayed, the company, New York City Opera stayed at the Hotel Figueroa, but the lights went out on the sign, so it was the hot fig. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. Yeah. And Beverly Sills, know, who headed the company, was active with the company, yeah. knowing that the Met didn't go to Los Angeles, brought City Opera to Los Angeles right. and tried to develop an opera tradition. But it didn't happen because Dorothy Chandler, who was the owner of the Los Angeles Times and a big supporter of the arts, built the music center, the Chandler Center, but said no opera here. But it was only after she retired or died that the movement began with Olympics to have an opera company in LA. They began with Carla Maria Giulini doing Falstaff with Renato Bruzon with the LA Philharmonic, but then Peter Hemmings was hired to create an opera company. And actually he brought me out there to work with him on that. But 
I was offered a job in LA, but I, I loved the Met. I was happy at the right. Met. So well, I turned it down, but worked there. But LA has, now they do great work. Oh, they but, do. But also, Fred, I got to say that Placido really made that company in many, many regards. He gave his heart and soul to it. And the couple of times that I worked there, I stayed in one of his one of the apartments that he and Martha own. And um, I just, I can remember, it was actually during, after our big earthquake here. And there were still tremors in, in, in uh, Los Angeles. And I remember the, the sort of light things, the light fixtures swaying in the, some of the aftershocks, but I mean, God bless Placido for oh, I know. He, he did there. God bless him, you know. We he, all love Peter that. Peter Hemming sadly him. died pretty young, and it was really Placido who then lifted the company. And he did, and he, he Christopher got all Kelsch is the manager, and Jimmy Conlon is music director. It's yeah. a wonderful company. Jimmy does it. He's the great Jimmy Conlon, great job, with whom yeah. you've worked. Um, I just want to go back to one more topic to our dear Nita Lawson, because I think it's important. Many people who go to the opera don't realize how an opera wig is made. They make a sort of web that fits the skull of each artist. Right. Usually you wear a sort of cap to keep your hair in and then the web goes on top. And the wig designer for the character will use either human hair if it's a dark wig, and they would often at that time would get the hair from Korea, dark, long, dark hair. Yeah. But if it was white hair, so when you played Octavian and, and Octavian had a white wig, that was yak hair that came from Mongolia. And I remember <laughs> Nina for hours sewing yak hair oh. into this webbing to make the wigs for the 18th century operas, it would be white wigs, or, and we're gonna talk about him later, Jean-Pierre Ponel often had white wig characters. Yes. And therefore Nina would have to manufacture, not just for the soloists, for the chorus. And Idomeneo, which I wanna, let's talk about Idomeneo right now, um, had all these white wigs on the chorus in addition to the white wigs and some of the soloists. So let's get to a Domineo. I'm just going to put a parenthesis here that we'll go back to. Let me interrupt yes. one second. I, I want to say to you how fantastic it is that you are doing your show because it, it brings an awareness of what we've all had. My generation, the next generation, the, the, even the older generations, um, of what it takes to put those people on stage of, you know, I used to figure that for every step I took on stage, there were probably 50 people that got me there, you know, and that's an understatement. I'm not even including the financial parts of it, you know, but just in everything that goes on and it's hats off to you and hats off to all the people that you know, contribute well, thank you. Well, I believe in supporting opera at all the arts and not just in New York, but really all, all over the world, because we have viewers all over the world. And, and all right, I'll put a domino to the side for a moment. You and I. No, that's OK. No, but there's a reason. Anyway, you'll see why you and I didn't know each other in the 70s. But I discovered in my research that we led kind of parallel lives in that you left the Met to go to Europe to build your career. And I had not yet been at the Met. I'd worked at the Lyric Opera of Chicago. And I went to Europe, to Italy primarily, to learn more and study and so forth. And so in the mid to late 70s, when I lived there, I got to see you perform a lot in Europe. Oh. Okay. Before I came back to work at the Met in 1979-80, and you came back around the same time. And so working in Europe in the 70s, where you worked with Vankarian, Schulte, Hanel, Streller, who was my teacher, Giorgio oh, Streller. So much. Oh. Would you talk about Giorgio Streller specifically in Paris and Carubino? Oh, you and bet. what was he like to be directed by and what did he teach you and was he difficult? He was not difficult to these artists. 
He okay. probably was a nightmare to the to the house, you know, to the company. <laughs> but he was not difficult to his. The the thing I remember the most about Giorgio was, and don't think I called him Giorgio either. <laughs> you know, it was when you were delivering an aria, and in, in that particular production, there was a very raped stage, and I adore raped stages because I think they just catapult the action out. Um, he would stand beside you and not, not copy you or instruct you. He would just stand beside you while you were singing. And he knew, of course, he knew the lyrics and what he was doing, but it was that it was like the energy of a tornado going inside you. I'll never forget it. I'll just, and he, he insisted on Kerubino walking in a, in a well-born way, you know, in a courtly manner. Um, and I had these gorgeous shoes, handmade. I, I wish I had bought them or stolen them because um, I, I just was in love with them. And, he would work, when we worked it, the first time was at Versailles. Um, he had the full set up. We weren't in costume, but he had everything. The lights and everything was genuine that was on the set from the, pr from the production. So that, you could see that could cause quite a lot of trouble for, an, for a mm. company. But since we were at the Gabriel Theater in Versailles, you know, it was possible. And we, I think I remember that in one session, say from 10 o'clock till one, we worked on one recit. The, you know, mm -hmm. that one recit. So by the, and he insisted on, oh, it was six weeks of rehearsal every day. By the time you got to the stage, it was second nature to you. You know, it, it just, he, he infu he didn't teach us, he infused us. Now I do remember a couple of times when we were, it had moved into Paris at the Paris Opera, the old Paris Opera. Um, and for some reason at one point, you know, on the back of the opera, the, the stage door, it was near Galerie Lafayette. So it was always very crowded. And there was some kind of a demonstration and there were bombs going off and all of us were sort of taking cover inside. Out walks Strehler, <laughs> Giorgio's trailer, right into the middle of it, just where he belongs, you know? And he never, he also never spoke to us in, um, he never spoke to me anyway in English. And that's how I learned Italian, because, you know, if he's saying girati, you, you better learn what it means. And that was yeah. a gift. I think he was one of the most brilliant men I've ever known. He... And with a, and with a brilliant heart, yeah. he went smack to the beginning. All of his productions had humanity. I wouldn't say that they had simplicity because they're all thought through, but they were all very spontaneous. Right. And so that your Carabino was remarkably spontaneous, even in the context of what the Ponte and Mozart gave you and all the moments that the character has. But I always remember thinking that Streller invented each of these operas that either I worked with him on, which were a few Mozart operas in Verdi, Simone Bocanegra and Macbeth. And um, and you reminded me of something just now that I forgot about. This accompanying the artist on the stage. We did Simone Bocanegra about two years after your Carubino. We did it in Milan. And it's a brilliant production. And Morella Franey was the um, Amelia, Maria Amelia. And she stood at the top of the stage. And Streller came and walked with her down. And it was my job then to restage the scene when, when Streller was on tour. And Franey stood at the top of the stage. And I waited sort of at the bottom of the stage near the orchestra pit and the bottom was in the pit and he whispered to me and he said fred you have to go up to the stage morella is waiting for you and i went up there and she said to me in italian she said Endo solo con un direttore. I, I only go down with the director 
God and lover. that's great. It was fascinating because you remind me of something else that yes, we only worked in Italian. Yeah. And that's a change from then to now is that in many theaters in Europe and even often at the Met, we would work in Italian because that was the common language of opera, even right. if we were doing a German or Russian or English or French opera, because if you had a Korean tenor and a, a Russian baritone and a Polish soprano and a South American uh, mezzo <laughs> and so on, we spoke Italian to each other. Yeah. And yes, I kind of spoke it before I came under Streller's influence, but Zeffirelli did that too in Europe, not at the Met, he spoke in English at the Met. Yeah. But I always wonder whether Streller would have had more of a career in the States if he had spoken more English. And uh, what we I, missed. Could... I suspect, Yeah. I'm just saying it from my brief, little knowledge of him, um, that what he insisted upon, which was so valuable, wouldn't have been able to have been supported by the company. Yeah. And if he, he almost was like, I think he was like a film director, you know, in many regards. He, he oversaw everything. I mean, in the, the very first time that we did Marriage of Figaro at, in Versailles, you know, he staged each act. It was a different time of day. Mm -hmm. And it was so brilliant the way the light would come. The light really came across windows just the way it would in the early morning. And so much of that is part of his plan that I think I'm not sure that companies could have supported that. Um, but I don't think, because I've heard him, I mean, he knew German. I know he knew German because I've heard him speak German. Um, I don't think he knew much English or didn't choose to speak it, maybe. He was know. from Trieste and he was bilingual German Italian because people right. in Trieste often are. Yeah. So that's why his German was good. And, and I did work on some German operas with him, especially the Entfuhrung aus dem Serai, the abduction from the Seraglio, um, which we did in Salzburg. Yeah. And his German was flawless. Yeah. And so. And he both, but, I remember him speaking French to, you know, mm -hmm. to the machinist and everybody at, at Paris Opera. But I, in 1976, I was not there, but you were on tour in Washington at the Kennedy Center for the Bicentennial in a, I believe an Australia production. I would have, I should have checked this before coming, but I believe that you came with the Paris Opera and La Scala. That's right. I yeah. remember that. Yeah. Actually, I don't remember that, but I'm glad that you reminded me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, when a production belongs, and, and Jean-Pierre was the same, when a production belongs that intensely to the man who created it, it'll sort of never be the same for you afterwards. You know, it's, it's too special. It's just too magnificent. Which leads me to Jean-Pierre Ponel. Okay. Um, who I scarcely knew. I met him, but I didn't have any work experience with him, but I revered him. And as my guests know always, I ask them to uh, provide me with some musical selections that we'll talk about in a bit. I added one. Um, I've never done this before because all the selections are from the Adagio catalog. I added a YouTube clip that is not from Adagio and my apologies to Adagio, which I love, because his, Pennell's production of La Cenerentola, which is a wonderful opera, but not my favorite opera, but it's a wonderful opera, I think is the most perfect opera production I've ever seen of anything ever. I have to agree with you. I really do. I've, I've only done one other production, but I think it's um, Jean-Pierre had an incredible inner sense of chic, really chic, as basic as that. He he was an, such an artist, and he created these sets that were, they, they were often related in some degree, but he had this perfection of the visual presentation of it with costumes as well, and they were so distinctly his. You know, um, 
I think he was a mastermind, I really do. I adored him. Mad, mad crush on Jean-Pierre. If my memory serves, he was French Swiss and not French. Uh -huh. But I mentioned that only because while for many people I'm Italian identified, I've spent a lot of my time studying French culture and history and art and so on. And the French philosophers have raison, reason, and the rationality that so informs just about everything French, except for a few irrational things. But for the most part, everything is based on reason, which is something I fully embrace. And Ponell's productions were all about that. Right. You are so right about that. And having lived in France as long as I did, that's one of the things I adored more than anything. I mean, you know, you go to the market and how everything is laid out and you don't, at least in my, when I was there, you didn't go to one big supermarket, but even there, there was a certain chic about it. And if you didn't like your strawberries, you know, you'd say, oh, madame, les fraises, c'était pas formidable. She said, oh, 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 non, c'est pas possible. Oh, la, la. Voilà, je vous donne, you know, they'd give you a whole new thing of strawberries because you said they weren't quite ripe or, and you, it was expected. It was expected. And I learned the mo most about French, both speaking and, and appreciating when I was a nanny there, way mm -hmm. before singing anything. My first opera was at the Paris Opera because I had a boyfriend who was, um, he wasn't, it was a big military school, but he had the Napoleon outfit on mm -hmm. and of course I'm going to go to a ball at the opera house with that decor, you know. <laughs> but it was from living there that I learned to just so appreciate everything French. Going to the doctor was amazing, mm -hmm. it, you know, everything. So I agree with you. It's I've been to French doctors. I know exactly what you're yes, saying. It's, it becomes, you know, you're in their home. It, they practically ask you for tea, you know. it's. Yep. Um, but so I, is that why you sang J'aime le militaire? <laughs> <laughs> You're darn right. I wish I, oh, it was it, the Ecole Militaire. Yeah, he's, he's, right. He, he's now a judge, this boy. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ponell, the La Cenerentola, which, you know, on its face is kind of a silly story. It's Cinderella, it's saint Rion. Right. Um, of a girl who's a cleaner. Uh, she's practically the slave of the household with her stepsisters. And um, who in the Rossini opera, it's not a slipper that fits or doesn't fit. It's sort of a bracelet or a piece of jewelry. And what I adored among many things is production, obviously including your performance, was the transition the journey that Angelina the character makes from singing Una Volta um, Cher Un Re, singing this song as she's cleaning up and she's in the ashes practically Cinderella yeah. Sandrion means the girl in the ashes to um, her awakening of kindness and rather than taking revenge on the people who treated her badly, it was, it's like La Clemenza di Tito, it's like Fidelio, it's like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, right. all in one, but with no heavy hand. And I saw it live, but the video is wonderful because of what they do with the camera, that you are framed in the set and the people who have affected you and you've affected come in and out. Francisco arises, the love yeah. interest. And then at a certain point, the camera comes in toward you. You move forward to the camera and you think, okay, that's it. But then the camera pulls back and you get the full picture again and you can see her embrace of everyone and everything. Non più mesta, no longer sad. Yeah. And it's, you know, 
it's a comic opera relatively, but I always would find myself in tears watching that. Well, and all the, when you think of all the funny things that he did, you know, right in the opening when they, uh, Angelina goes out one door and the prince comes in and then they, they, I mean, he, Jean-Pierre had a sensational sense of humor, mm -hmm. really sensational. Um, and he had, he has that same energy as, as Giorgio, that, you know, when he hasn't, there were maybe a couple of hours in any production that he wasn't there for some reason, probably going to the costume fittings or something like that. It was as though the entire theater were empty because he had that energy. I mean, I remember him running up onto the stage, you know, and cigarette in one hand, and, um, you know. Um, he was just, and he had very, he had very funny ideas. I'll tell you too that stay with me. At the end, in the scene you're talking about, when, when Angelina goes to uh, the prince, um, at one point, he wanted the prince to be really firm with her, to say, no, you go and, you go and sing this now. She was too shy, you know, there was a little moment. And it was quite a, you know, you're my wife now, you do what I say. It was a, you know, maybe a, a, a royal view of it, but it was marvelous. And the other thing was with Cherubino. And it's the only thing I ever disagreed with anybody on, on Cherubino is that he felt there was a side of Cherubino that was really, really pompous and um, which I think he's right in, in the end. And by doing it his way, I learned a thousand times more, not that I ever would have stood up to someone, anyone. Um, he was right. But it was, he was always emphasizing that little arrogant edge of Cherubino. And it was, I mean, it was marvelous. I learned so, so much from Jean-Pierre. I mainly learned to absolutely love doing what I do. Yeah, which leads me back to New York and to the Met and a production that to me was just another knockout because I knew most of Mozart's operas, having worked on them or studied them. The one that I did not know was a Domineo. And that came in 1982 at the Met with a certain Luciano Pavarotti singing, doing a rare foray into Mozart. Right. And that opera actually in Mozart's lifetime was his most successful financially. And it was one of his longest. It premiered in Munich at the Court Theater in Munich in, in 1781. And Mozart had to compose for the cast that was there. And whoever the tenor was, was quite elderly and not in his prime vocally and so on. And this is not a judgment of Luciano Pavarotti or Placido Domingo or Ben Hepner, all the people who sang the role but just that the requirements of the role of a Domineo vocally were not the most demanding. Right. And as you well know better than anyone, the voice moves differently in Mozart than it does in Verdi. And therefore not every man who can sing in Rigoletto can sing in a Domineo. Right. But Pavarotti's gorgeous Italian and looking like he could be a Greek king, um, and you playing his son, and basically it's a, it's he's saved, and the first person he sees or shakes a hand with or says hello, I forget the detail, has to die, and that's your character. There's Ilya, who is played by Ileana Kotrubash. Yeah. Um, there is my first experience working with Hildegard Behrens as Electra. Yes. But again, we don't think of her automatically as a Mozartian. But in Ponell's red wig and big dress and so on, oh, later people like Carol Vaness saying that that was more congenial. Barron's, though not exactly the ideal electorate, was a fantastic electorate. 
So here you had James Levine conducting a Ponell production with all of its rationality. And what I remember so well about that production was every movement by every one of you clearly had a meaning and had been thought through, but never for a moment did it feel automatic. That's, and that's, that's very much Jean-Pierre. Some of the, 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 you know, ensembles were, took the longest time. I do remember that because they, he choreographed them essentially, mm -hmm. but he choreographed them to make the point, not to just have choreography, but to make, to keep each character individual. I mean, Hildegard was, ah. Uh, mind-boggling in that role and i think that that her temperament really suited it so perfectly um and i didn't mind too much that luciano nearly cut my head off <laughs> how did that happen <laughs> well that was it was in the scene you know he nearly is ready to sacrifice his son yes. and he has the sword drawn and i said luciano grazie stasera <laughs> Um, but I did get to know him during that, and by that point, um, I had, was it 1982? 82. I had, my girls were alive, and I used to take them, I always took them to the theater, because the theater was such a warm place. It was so much fun, mm -hmm. and Nina and Rosie would let them sometimes dress up in some of the hats and wigs and backstage, and i never forget Luciano was um going to do something gosh i can't remember maybe it was a when it wasn't a domineo but i had taken the kids to see him do something else oh tosca ernani tosca he did tosca, tosca with shirley verrett and then ernani with caballé and that yeah, and, no, Luna it was tosca. and i i yeah. took the kids in because i may have had rehearsals and and he saw them and he said um come here come here i want to show you something you know and he had all his wounds for the you know <laughs> the last act and he said do you know how they do this and you know my girls were uh five and two they said no mr Pot. he said it's with toothpaste so here taste it have some toothpaste <laughs> they thought he became thereafter their complete and utter hero and that's who he was, you know, that's very much who he was. He was just big and warm and adorable and more gifted than, you know, many, many souls on the earth today. Did you happen to see Ron Howard's documentary about Pavarotti? I was the opera advisor on that film. Were you, Fred? Yeah. It's and Luciano and I were very close friends for 29 years. Um, you know, as you well know in opera many people are colleagues but then certain people you form friendships with right. and in opera i would say i have maybe six or seven people who are close friends and he was one of them and he was a magnificent person we used to cook together all the time so i know exactly what you're saying about his reaching into other plates yeah, <laughs> um, but what a what a man you know and i loved i loved the documentary and I loved meeting, you know, his his wife. I, I, I met I met his first wife a couple of Adua. times. Adua, that's right. But I thought she was so lovely and so wanting to honor him, you know. And I didn't know they had a child. Well, you know? the first with Adua, they had three daughters. Three daughters, and I met. And then with Nicoletta, daughter. he had a, a, Alice Alice. His second wife, he had Alice. So and there were four daughters total. How old would she be now? Alice, well, I'm guessing, I, I would have to look it up, but I'm probably a teenager. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. I, I had baby. never she known about baby. that. You know, he was really a little baby when he got sick and died now 12 yeah. years ago. Yeah. So she'd probably be 15 or 16, I'm guessing. Yeah. And the other three daughters are adult women. And one thing about Ottawa, among many things about Ottawa, she and Luciano both spoke the most gorgeous Italian. And 
be you could tell where the singing came from it was a connection of that oh, yeah they were from modena and he didn't really have the modenese accent which has the lilt in it and a little bit of a lisp yeah he got that out of his speech but ottawa had the lilt and the lisp and it was like listening to irish people but in italy, in italy. The, the sort of charming upswing of the sound of the voice and she had she too had a lovely has a lovely speaking voice yeah a little deeper she'd be a mezzo soprano but i mean a a deeper, deeper mezzo-soprano. Um, which actually leads me to a question I didn't know when I was going to ask, but I'll ask it now. There are certain mezzo-sopranos, and you certainly would be one of them, I think, who sing not just traditional mezzo music and not just traditional soprano music, but it's what the Germans call Zwischenfach, where yeah. it's an in-between where there you've done some soprano roles you've done mezzo roles but you've not necessarily done the the so-called what martina royal calls the big girls the big girls right like yeah. Amneris and eboli and and those roles and so i've heard you sing roles that sometimes are done by sopranos like melisande mm -hmm. for example um when you select your repertory, is it based on the notes you know you have, or is it what are you drawn to when you pick a role? As far as ever picking roles, I owe not just that, but a huge chunk of my career to Matthew Epstein. And Matthew, who I just spoke to the other day, um, he was such a fan for so many years and close to Jackie and uh, not, I don't mean a fan of mine, but just a fan of opera and yes. so knowledgeable like yourself that it was all his doing. He was the first one to say I should sing Melisande. He said, you know, it's, it, you know, she doesn't say a whole lot beyond, je ne suis pas heureuse, je suis heureuse, <laughs> you know, um, but I think it was character and, the, you know, the type of sort of shy and withheld character. All the Massenet that he got me into was the Cendrillon, which I'm so glad came into the repertoire again, mm -hmm. um, which has high notes, you know, which, um, but it sits, sits lower. It sits more in a Mimi range than, mm -hmm. than a high soprano. Um, the best gift he gave me was doing, uh, oh, we talked to Terry's production, Perigol. Mm -hmm. Grand Duchesse, all of that is Matthew's doing. Good. He, and you know, I was, I'm ignorant enough in the business and, and was certainly at that time that I was lucky enough to just be able to follow his lead and look at the roles and work on them and see if I could do them. And they were like my favorites in the end. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, I sang Cherubina way beyond the age of decency. Um, I had to find something else. But Fred, the first arias I used to audition work because I got the mezzo book. Mm -hmm. Get this, for Odon Fatale. Oh, no. <laughs> and it was like Minnie Mouse singing it, you know? It was just <laughs> so wrong. And, and voices, some voices grow and develop, but some voices just stay this, in the same area, you know? They don't necessarily go up or down but they don't get bigger you, you just we haven't found a pill yet to make them bigger um, that's okay <laughs> it's okay no um so when i was performance manager of the met a big part of my job was if the artists namely the singers but sometimes instrumentalists had particular needs, problems, concerns, whatever, they sometimes would turn to the artistic department ahead of time, but during performances, it was my responsibility. And I recently had as my guest on the show, Catherine Malfitano, with whom I've I become very good friends, I but it, I didn't I know it. Catherine much at the Met. We knew each other in passing because like you, she was very at home at the Met and very secure and well-supported and, and sane. And therefore, 
I was not called upon very much to help out when you or she was on the stage. But I wonder if you remember one night when I was called upon. If you don't, I'll remind you the story, but it's very, very funny. I I, I keep a diary. It was November 25th, 1983. How do you and <laughs> you were singing or about to sing. You hadn't gone on stage yet. Blanche de la Force in, in Poulenc's Dialogues of the Carmelites with a wonderful cast included Mignon Dunn and Patricia Craig and Gwyn Cornell and Jean Craft and um, in other words what Martina Arroyo would call apart from you big girls in other words not heavy but just yeah. secure able confident Mignon Dunn is you know so secure and wonderful and um i got a call that there was an emergency in the dressing room area and i had to come running now all of you were dressed as nuns so when i came in there already all of everybody i saw were nuns and minion dunn patricia craig gene craft formidable person were all standing on chairs screaming and you were not standing on a chair, but you were backed all the way into a corner. And Minyon Dunn was pointing at something. I had no idea what it was. And I thought it might be a dead person. Um, it was a very adorable mouse. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. And, and all these nuns were flying nuns basically above, <laughs> above the ground <laughs> as this mouse darted about just doing what mice do. And the only member of your cast I did not see was Betsy Norton, high yeah. soprano singing. Oh, I remember Costanz. Betsy, so, yeah. And Costanz was the most, you know, beneficent, dear, innocent, character and Betsy has a very high voice wow. and all of a sudden this blur goes by of a nun's habit and a shoe that she had taken off and she cornered the mouse and she said I got him and she killed the mouse. <laughs> that, that, that is so divine I know. Adorable Betsy having the only courage. <laughs> With all the quote big girls. <laughs> big girls. Oh my God, that is oh thank you for telling me that. Oh God, I love I, I sort of calmed this. you all down and I'm just gonna get my dog in. Okay, bring the dog in. <laughs> oh. she'll, soon, she'll soon disappear, but um that's okay. So I was just saying that I calmed the cast down. And because everybody, especially Mignon, who is from Memphis and was cursing in Southern and, <laughs> <laughs> and got you to the stage. And then it was a beautiful performance. But I, I kept that production. While all of you were on stage, I was having the the remains of the mouse given a dignified <laughs> departure <laughs> because Betsy really crushed that mouse. <laughs> she really got after him. Yeah, that is great. Did Fred? Did, did you ever know um, Francis Robinson? Very well. So let's talk oh. about Francis Robinson. Francis oh. Robinson um, was at that time the Met. There were people who were quote met family. Another was a gentleman named Ozzy Hawkins from Atlanta. Of course. And Ozzy Hawkins was was a bass. Well, the voice. The voice. This yeah. is Ozzy Hawkins, and his mother made roast beef with Coca Cola. And I'm not kidding. I once tasted hot roast actually with co cooked with Coca Cola. It was not good. But. <laughs> <laughs> Francis Robinson was also very gentlemanly, and he was sort of the speaker, the public voice, the presenter, not not the radio broadcaster, which was um, Milton Cross, and then Peter Allen, and then dear Margaret Juntway, and now um, Mary Jo Heath. Yeah. But I was of the era, sort of the end of Milton Cross and all of Peter Allen, mostly, and I know knew Margaret and know Mary Jo, but 
it was Francis Robinson was a separate kind of thing. He was the Met personified in a way, the way Tony Randall did a bit, but Francis Robinson really was the one. I, I couldn't agree more. Talk about Francis. Well, Francis, he was, filled a position at the Met that like, like you, that is invaluable. It's, um, he not only over, took care of the artists, literally, the way you do. He loved them, but he also took care of the donors. Yes. And he treated them, they treated them very, very, very much like um, beloved children, you know? Mm -hmm. And he had, as you say, first of all, he was <laughs> very, okay. very, he moved very slowly. He moved very gracefully. He spoke very slowly. He spoke very gracefully. So you can imagine how great that presence is in a crazy opera house, you know, mm -hmm. with tempers and whatever is going on, emergencies. And I just had incredible respect for him. I just, when, and where you noticed him the most was on tour. Give me one second. Come here. No, we're not playing ball right now. No. <laughs> She's barking because her ball is under the... You can the, uh, bring her up onto the screen if you want. I would, I would but she, yeah. she's not going to come without her ball. So she'll okay. just she'll <laughs> whoop up occasionally. Um, he just, you know, you always kind of found yourself looking for him. He, he filled in for Sir Rudolph. He filled in, I think, for all the management in a very special way. And in fact, after he died, I really, I didn't have the influence or the, the you know, the credentials in any way to, but I, I had a great, great friend who is a great friend to this day, um, uh, who I wanted to maybe, fill this position um, of Francis, because I think it is, it's a, li it's a liaison. It's a liaison between the artists and the management and the company. And it's, it's- And the public. It, and the public. And it's invaluable. And it has to be someone like you who is beautifully educated, beautifully spoken, has an incredible memory. Uh, the, my friend that I thought would be perfect for it, but it didn't suit his life. And, was Charlie Scribner, mm -hmm. who I, I sort of grew up with. He's younger than I am, but I just adore, 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 adore this man. And he would have been the only, you know, not the only, but one of the people I would have suggested way back when. Um, Francis was, he was kind of like a guardian angel. Yeah. And he didn't seek favor, he, you know, he, he, because you were only singing Il Re, you know, he paid attention to you, um, so it was very flattering. But he, he just had a way of drifting through situations with poise and grace and... Excuse me one second. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But a diva's work is never done. <laughs> she, she is, um, she's a diva dog. She really is. <laughs> so okay. did you, you ever go to Francis Robinson's apartment? No, no, okay. I wa wasn't that. that I, I was up there once because he was having a little gathering. And what, I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm a pretty good cook, and I would often go to different singers' houses after the performance, especially non-American singers. Right. Um, and either cook with them or keep them company, and just because it was an extension of my job. And it was an honor to do it, and I would do that often with Leonie Riesenek, who I revered. Um, I did it with Kiri Takanawa for a period where we cooked together and so on. She's a good cook, too. And um, Luciano and I always would cook together. And 
Francis Robinson said to me once, well, I understand you're a pretty good cook. Um, we're having a few guests and donors over and you can just rustle up what's ever in my refrigerator. And if you would make something, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. In Francis Robinson's refrigerator were three bottles of vodka, six bottles of champagne, sour cream, caviar, and that was it. There was I'm no pasta. My own heart. There was no tomato. There was no nothing. No that I or butter. Up. Or... <laughs> I'm just gonna... One second. I'm going to put So for those of you just joining me, my guest is Frederica von Stada. Today is New Year's Day, 2021, and I'm having a wonderful I'm time. I'm so sorry. And that's okay. And who is that? She's now captive. Sorry. This is my husband, Mike. Hi there. Hi. Come on, come with me. Oh, thank you, honey. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So Francis Robinson's empty refrigerator. Um, all I could do was serve beverages and, and caviar because that's all he had. And I said, Francis, you want me to rustle things up? And he said, you're right. I guess I should get a few things in the house. So next time I sent over pasta, canned tomatoes, just a few things. As it turned out, I never went back there again to cook. But Apparently, his refrigerator was always basically beverages and fish eggs. Right. Okay. <laughs> Good enough for me. So, yeah. um, in putting together your musical influences from the Adagio catalog, the first thing you said to me was Victoria de Los Angeles, an artist who definitely was a soprano, but occasionally would sing certain mezzo roles right, right. So there's a similarity why because i know you've heard schwarzkopf and you heard many great artists early on what was it about victoria de los angeles that singles her out um for me the the voice matched her face and her heart and it just everything i you know and i'm not a, an aficionado but I did do, um, maybe two years ago, her, she has a foundation and they asked me to come and sing for the foundation. And I did have a chance to, to be with her when once at the Olympics in Barcelona. And her family are, you know, still absolutely, completely devoted to her. And she just, there's something that comes through in her voice that, I mean, I, as, as I say her name, I can, I can feel my eyes starting to water, you know? And I, I can't explain it. Um, it wasn't the perfection of the technique, or, which she had. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the, the incredible, magnificent songs that she sang in the concerts. It was, I think, her spirit. And when I did s sing at the Olympics with her, she was that. She's a true diva, mm -hmm. you know, and, and her daughter-in-law um, gave me, her ex-daughter-in-law, um, no, yeah, her ex-daughter-in-law gave me a pair of her earrings. Uh -huh. um, and I mean, they are like the greatest treasure I have, that they were on her ears next to her voice and her heart. Mm -hmm. it, I just adored her, you know, and I never saw her perform live except at the at the Olympics. You really? Know? Yeah. I she did. actually was. That was the first recital I ever went to was Victoria de Los Angeles. De Los really? Angeles, because my dad was a trombonist and a passionate music lover, and and knew his music. There were things that he didn't care for that I never understood. Like Verdi was not his thing much of the music that you sing was exactly in his wheelhouse and therefore he was a big collector of your recordings and listener to you but when he raised me on voices 
I was raised on Victoria de los Angeles, or as he said, de Los Angeles, yeah. as my soprano, Marilyn Horn as my mezzo soprano, UC Beerling as my tenor, and Ezio Pins as my bass. There was no baritone, and I don't know why no baritone, but no baritone. But therefore, when de los Angeles came to New York, in, I believe it was 1965, to do a recital at uh, City Center, Right. which is a big gaping barn of a place and sold out city center. And there she was on this very large stage, not good acoustics there, but I didn't know that at the time. And she sang a traditional recital of song repertory with a pianist, I believe it was Gerald Moore. And then um, he left the stage and she came back on the stage with a guitar and accompanied herself on the guitar and sang for about another hour. And oh, the audience, which included many Spaniards, would call out her. It was a very quiet audience before, yeah. very respectful, but they would start commenting as she sang and as she played the guitar. And it went basically from classical music to flamenco night yeah. to Spanish culture night. And oh. she was a Catalan. And at that time, Franco, Francisco Franco was the dictator, the caudillo in Spain. Yeah. And as a Catalan, she was among the artists like Carreras and Caballé and others who were against the fascist government in Madrid. And many of the people who were anti-fascist were in exile in New York. And um, in the Spanish Civil War, there was the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, and these were Americans, mostly from New York City, who traveled to Spain to fight against the fascists. Ernest Hemingway wrote about that. So that night, I remember, too, that she had all the Abraham Lincoln Brigade survivors stand up, and she sang for them a song my father later told me was the anti-fascist song. So I got the sense not only of a beautiful singer, I didn't know enough about singing then, but about someone in front of an audience who yeah. could do Hugo Wolf in one moment and Brahms and then suddenly switch and do passionate right. Catalan and Spanish music and drive a crowd crazy the way Mick yeah. Jagger does. Oh, so that that's so her and it's I just um it just kills me that I didn't ever hear her live except that one little thing which was heaven and she sang you know her and I mean I was on the floor yeah. just on the floor and her her daughter-in-law is remarried um because her husband passed away that's one of Vittoria's children um and even her new husband they're both keeping this foundation running. Uh, it's just, it was such pure joy. It's, it's very much on a shoestring. But I performed in, in a beautiful, hot, it's a hospital, an old hospital in Barcelona that has mm -hmm. this maybe three gorgeous little recital halls. And I just loved every minute of it because one of the times when I was having a lot of um, woe in my, my mom had passed away and, I've discovered this saint in Barcelona, thanks to my manager there, whose name was Gloria Villardel, and was one of the great ladies of all time. Um, she took me to a church, and I was introduced uh, to Santa Rita, who is actually Italian. But Santa Rita just, I, I lit like 40 candles and prayed to her, and my life just got better immediately. So I was able to go back and have a little chat with Santa Rita <laughs> when I was there just recently. So I never thought we would get to Santa Rita, but I have a Santa Rita story too. <laughs> oh, you've got to tell me. Because she, she had two sons, I think, who were, who were murderers and convicts. Yeah. And, yeah. The saint, every, every saint in Italy has his or her day. Yeah. So... I don't know when St. Flicka is, but I know when St. Frederick and Frederica are. That's July 18th. You and I share the same Saints Day because of our names. But Santa Rita is September 4th. And 
the town that she's associated with is Viterbo, north of Rome. And there have been periods in my life with that where I've been disabled and I've used crutches or canes or wheelchairs or all that stuff. And among Santa Rita's, um, the things she's responsible for are people with disabilities and people with needs like that. And when I went to visit Viterbo one year on September 4th, I had no idea that it was her day and that Viterbo was the center of the place. And when disabled people are in Viterbo on September 4th, people in the town give them money and food and clothing and so on. And I was there with crutches <laughs> and I, people had to be money and had to be things. And I, I didn't know what to do with this. And someone had to explain to me what that was about. So um, I, you know, I left because I was supposed to take the money with me, but then I donated it to a cause where I was living in Milan. But um, I kept some of the clothing. I will say that. It's but great. I did. I had no idea who Santa Rita was, and therefore it's interesting that of all the saints that you could mention, right. that we have her in common too. Um, leads me. I guess I was not going to get there quite yet, but I, I, let's go to that now. Um, you have been very active in charitable causes, some of them inspired by your Catholic faith, not all. Um, in terms of giving, I'm going to make a distinction, giving and giving back. Because giving back is one thing, but giving without the sense of obligation or connection yeah. that way is a whole other instinct. And what prompted you to do that? And tell us about some of the things that you support. Um. Well, it probably came about by accident, quite honestly, um, a, a series of accidents, you know, because I, I know I sort of wanted to, but I'm not organized enough to get involved. And the first was, um, I met this wonderful nun named Sister Barbara Dawson, who is now head of Sacred Heart, in, and she's in Rome. But when I first met her, she was the president of a school in Oakland called St. Martin de Porres. And I went to some a, a bishop's evening somewhere that I was sang, sang at, and she introduced herself afterwards, and she's a real character. And she's a marvelous woman. And she, I said, well, do you have a music program at the school? And she said, no, we don't have anything like that. I said, I'll, I said, I'll come and start one. I'll, I'll, I'll help you start it. It would be really fun. So I began by cor corralling, it, it was only K through eight, and it's in two campuses, the, the K through five and then six, seven, eight at another campus, um, right in the heart of Oakland. And so I would just go and corral kids that were playing in the playground in their playtime and say, come on in, come on, come on in. And I would start to teach them songs and I'm not, I don't play the piano and I, I don't have an instrument that I can really work, so I involved a lot of my pals to come and help me. And we got going and it was really fun and we'd have them, it was a perfect solution to many of our galas, you know, fundraising galas to have, you know, bring in 18 adorable kids and the wallets come, you know, come out. Um, so then I thought, you know, I'd heard something that someone said that it's really wonderful that a kid has an instrument. Um, not every kid has the ability for a piano and they don't have, not, they're not, these kids are all low income. They're not gonna have pianos at home. So um, I started a little violin program and thanks to the blessed, most wonderful Mr. Getty gave us about 25 violins. Mm -hmm. And I found two wonderful, three wonderful teachers to start teaching violin. And really, it got going. I mean, they could, I wouldn't say anything close to being in tune, but they got a, the first time they would play an, with a, with a, uh, a bow, bow and hear an open A, that vibration got into their ear and they loved it. And it was, it was just something to, bring a little light on. Um, 
So we established that, and then the diocese closed. Uh, uh, Barbara had to move to Rome, and the diocese shortly thereafter closed this school because it was, it just, we had no money. The, none of the parents paid anything. Um, so uh, it went, then I got involved again through good fortune with a wonderful musician here named Jim Meredith, who plays the piano, and I, he's accompanied me many times with something called Young Musicians Choral Orchestra, YMCO. And it, it started in Berkeley about 50 years ago and was always a part of a, a Berkeley outreach type program. But with the advent of this amazing woman named Daisy Newman, who was a great singer and sang with Lenny a couple mm -hmm. of times in Europe, um, she took over the direction of YMCO and put it on the map. She has a, a principle which is the, the triangle. It's um, citizenship, musicianship, and education. And the purpose of this foundation, which starts kids at 10 through 18, they're not, the families really, it's all free. So the families, we had to sort of attach ourselves to a, a group of people that didn't earn probably over $30,000 a year, if that, and together, which is horrifying. Um, she, Daisy would audition them. Sometimes they would, you know, not even know what a clarinet looked like. But she formed it into an orchestra and chorus. So they have to, they all have to sing, and they all have to play instruments. And the, the purpose is to bring music to these kids that would never have it but it's also to get them into college. And we have so many success stories in that, in that uh, department. There's a fabulous guy named Akin Tunde who went to Yale and then Columbia Business School and has now started his own uh, clothing company. And we don't, we don't care if they end up in music, we just want it to be an adjunct to their lives. We have a drummer named Genius who is a genius. He's 16 and I mean you just can't believe this kid he's employed by half of the jazz orchestras in here in in Berkeley and Oakland um, so we're just keeping afloat right now we're doing all our teaching online um, we just made a video of their last concert which was all based around Mambo lovely Lenny and Rita Moreno um, who lives out here mm -hmm. and we're just keeping it, keeping it going with all our hearts and minds. And Daisy has an amazing assistant, Geechee Taylor, who is a, a trumpet player. And I mean, he's one of God's special creatures. So we're just, we got the office open and we're still teaching the kids. We normally have a eight week summer program, which goes from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. with meals included that where the kids really learn all day. They do all day music and they learn theory and everything like that, all the things that I never learned. Um, mm -hmm. And l lately, my latest project is I worked, I was lucky enough to volunteer a couple of times when I was in Dallas with, with uh, Joyce, doing Great Scott and other things with something called the Dallas Street Choir. And if you have a minute, go on their website. It's run by a young man named Jonathan Pallant, who is Bill's brother. Bill's okay. In the business. Mm -hmm. And he started this Dallas Street Choir, and it's phenomenal. We even sang at Carnegie Hall. He organized a trip for us and, and at the National Cathedral. Um, and I, I just, I loved so much being with the members of the choir. Um, that I want to replicate the Dallas Street Choir in Oakland. And we almost have a name. We had a name, but we um, think we need to adjust it because there's a Nezer organization which has the same initials, also servicing children. Um, mm -hmm. um, but it's going to be the Oakland People's Choir. And um, we're just going to set up in several different, we can't do shelters. Nothing can do shelters right now. but. There are many organizations that have programs, you know, showers, laundry, everything to help people that are on the street. Um, and so that's gonna be our, our 
power source, really. And I have the most amazing group on board, one of whom is uh, Nicole Foland, who is a singer, sang with Jake many times, and she's the brains. Um, uh, Michael Mohammed, Michael Morgan, who runs the Oakland East Bay Symphony, and a wonderful young bass baritone, Kenneth Kellogg, and his wife, Megan, Kenneth. who is, I've known since she was in the girls' choir. So it's got young blood in it. Mm -hmm. Our board of YMCO is a bunch of old people right now, <laughs> but Kenneth asked, said he would join with us. And one thing I really want to say that's really important to me is this generation of young singers, the Sasha Cooks and Joycey and um, Kenneth and all the, young, the, you know, they're very civic minded. I, it, the the uh, pandemic has helped this happen because it's robbed them of their livelihood, literally, for the last year um, and robbed them of their passion, which is heartbreaking. It just is heartbreaking. Um, so they, they already have a, a finger in what they want to do with their careers. And I didn't have that at all when I was building my career. It was like, flicka, 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 what's my next job? Do I have enough? Can I do that? And can I learn the music and blah, blah, blah. And oh, wow, you know. But I wasn't thinking that way at all. Um, and I'm so grateful for the people that have come into my life who have taught me this. One of the people who's coming on our board um, was a foster mother for a, a kid that, that we fostered. I mean, he doesn't live with us, but we've know, I've known him since first grade. Um, and so I have connections to her, and her job is to teach, they, she adopts like 25 families and make sure they're all all right. It's so brutal here right now. It's gotta yeah. be in New York too. It's, it's just, it's criminal that this money hasn't come through for our citizens, you know. Many of our families at YMCO, at least six are homeless. Of our families, um, you know, the street choir is all homeless. Um, it's, and, and the families that have managed to make it are, in, you know, in service, you know, in some way they have to go to work. They can't stay home. They have four or five children. But I'll send you a copy of our YMCO thing that we're celebrating. Is there a um, website? Could it be ymco.org or something yeah. like that? Okay. YMCO. Yeah. Um, and it's not as full as it's going to be because one of the jobs that Kenneth has agreed to is to take over our social media. You know, my social media thing is... Here's the iPhone, here's the, you know, which one, which button do I push, you know? I think it's a miracle that I got to talk to you. <laughs> um, Joyce D. Donato and Eric Owens are involved in a program through Carnegie Hall. Carnegie Hall has always been very active, but especially now under Clive Gillinson, in social outreach. And what Joyce and Eric do is they sing in prisons. I know. They, I've seen her. I've seen her. Her videos from there. I love it. Yeah. And she sang that song that a prisoner wrote. Mm hmm Yeah. So there's another social thing that you've done, and and you and I once did it together. I don't know if you remember. This would be about twelve years ago. Um, called Classical Action, which was founded by a gentleman named Charles Hamlin, and you and I were both on a cruise ship in scandinavia yeah uh, appearing performing speaking you with charles and many people who were supporters of classical action signed up to come on this trip and part of the the money derived went to classical action which supports and support at the time persons living with aids right uh, the aids and um so you and I, I remember that you were on for just a few days and I, I thought that was unfortunate. I was on for the whole cruise. I know we had to we had to come late for some reason. I, I think you came on in Copenhagen off in St. Petersburg, right. whereas yeah. I saw every Norwegian village. And <laughs> yeah, I love but, them. But it's, you know, there are what I've been thinking about so much in the past pandemic year, I always do, but particularly now, 
is not just the obvious of how we miss the arts and have to support the arts and what artists can do, but the artist's connection to the human experience and how the artist through his or her gifts and insights and own life experience teaches us so much about who we are, teaches us humanity. As I was talking before about Ponell and you in Cenerentola, mm -hmm. that normally is not, the Cinderella story is not number one on my hit parade of, of teaching about life experience. And yet it completely was. And yeah. so much of what you and many of your colleagues do is that. So um, I'm a big proponent of, I would like to see, I would like to be the first secretary of arts and culture in the United States, but if I'm not it, I would like someone else to do it. Miss Fred, I'm on your team. You know, Matthew Epstein is working hard at putting this together. We should have a cabinet post. Yeah. And I vote for you. I mean, Thank when you. you look at, I mean, just the technical things like what the arts bring to a city, look, look what happened to Santa Fe because of Santa mm -hmm. Fe Opera. I know the art as well. Okay, music and art built it into what it is. It commercially brought terrific revenue. It's, we ought to be, the arts ought to be rewarded for this um, and get some help. We're the only country um, that doesn't do it, you know? Sure. And that, God willing that, that Kennedy had lived longer because he certainly made great strides towards it, you know? And Richard Nixon, who is not number one on my list of favorite presidents, yeah. he radically expanded arts funding, and so did President George H. W. Bush. Right. Back because I worked for when I left the Met, I went to work for the National Endowment of the Arts, and that was in the Bush, in the Reagan, and then Bush years. Yeah. They actually expanded the presence of the arts, and I was fortunate to have as a friend Kitty Carlisle Hart who headed the New York State Council on the Arts. Right. And you can see what these people can achieve as administrators. Right. And occasionally arts gets politicized because art can be political. Right. Like Verdi's Don Carlo to name one thing among many, but it doesn't have to be. And I'm an advocate. We always talk about the STEM curriculum, science, technology, engineering, and math. I want the STEAM curriculum and add the arts in there because as you were talking before about the young man who went on to Yale and Columbia, right. um, music helped frame him. It helped his imagination. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And you know, we we need, I think, in America to treat it differently. I'm always amazed when I work in a place like Finland or Austria and the degree to which there's consensus about supporting the arts, no matter what the political persuasion of the people are. Well, it, it's, uh, someone sent me this wonderful Christmas thing of a, it's in Canada and it's a train, it's a tradition and all kids from music school play and sing and the train goes a certain route. Um, and it's, I mean, it's sensational. And it, you know, so a lot of the kids that I've worked with from St. Martin de Porras and YMCO, they've never heard anything really beautiful. They really haven't, nor have they seen anything very beautiful. Even though the Oakland Hills are right above Oakland, half those kids have never been up there, you know? Um, so if you just open their eyes to it and let them see it, um, there's, and there's talent galore. I mean, our kids are brilliantly talented, you know? So you mentioned a couple of times a fellow named Jake, who is Jake <laughs> Heggie. And one cannot discuss the career of Frederica von Stade without discussing the fact that in addition to doing Baroque in 18th century, 19th century, and early 20th century, you were one of the leading exponents of new work and new opera and have been since at least 1974. And you have created roles by many fine leading American and non-American composers. But I think it's fair to say that um, 
to borrow a title that I think you know, The Musician and the Muse, that you and Jake Hagee are mutually the musician and the muse. Oh, and okay. sometimes you're the muse and he's the musician, but I think it also works the other way, that you're the musician and he's the muse for you. Would you talk Thank about the operas you've done with him, but also yeah. about Jake Hagee? Thank you for saying Who was that. on that cruise, by the way, in Scandinavia. Of course. Um, <laughs> and his son, his son was on it and was made friends with all the old timers and they, those friendships have last, you know, he was 16 at the time. Anyway, um, I'm, I think I'm the, uh, maybe, maybe honorary first muse, but almost everybody that he writes for are his, his muses now. Um, and I encourage you to get on the, the uh, San Jose Opera website and see Susie's Three Decembers that was filmed. Susie Graham. Susie Graham, and it's brilliant. Anyway, that's one of the other things that fell into my life. Jake was doing uh, press for, for San Francisco Opera, so we'd go to some radio interviews and stuff like that, and, he's, and he said, I've written a couple of songs, can I show them to you? And they were arrangements of, of, of Irish folk songs sometimes. And I sat at the piano when he played them, and my jaw dro literally dropped about a foot. The combination of the way he sets words so that the words have the importance they deserve, the accompaniments, the everything that he did was, I mean, it was mind boggling. My, almost a week later, I had some concerts coming up and I said, can we do some concerts together, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Can we do this? And then word got around. I'll tell you what we were doing at the time was um, Conrad Souza's Dangerous Liaison. So I was telling everybody, Tom Hampson and Renee, and telling everybody about this guy. And we all started taking his phone number down very seriously. Now that's just his talent. His person, is just, I, I can't think, you know, I've run out of superlatives, I really have. He is a man of letters. He's beautifully trained. Um, a, a lot came from his relationship with, um, oh, now I've forgotten her name. A marvelous woman that he studied with for years, who was like in her 70s. And I think they were married for a short time. It was just one of those magic relationships. Um, he has a heart that is enormous, and he's brilliant. Jake really is, there's a genius in him. He, he doesn't sound like it all the time or look like it because he's so available, mm -hmm. you know? But I always think of him as being several, you know, flying up here above my head. And he made, he made, he gave me 15 years of singing, you know, um, right from the beginning with Three Decembers. And I used to, I've sung um, many, many, many of his, his works, you know, not his operas, but his works. I had more fun doing Great Scott with Joyce and his fabulous cast in Dallas. Um, an incredible cast, Eileen Perez, Michael oh, May, I mean, Anthony Roth, Costanzo. The fun we had, and Jack O'Brien directing yep. us. Oh and my Terrence God. McNally did the Terrence, libretto, yes. Our beloved, beloved, beloved Terrence there every day. I mean, yeah. it was heaven on earth. Um, I came for the premiere because I wanted to see that. Well, you know, the whole cast got together and, and did a benefit for the Dallas Street Choir while we were there. So everybody got on board um but I, I i his genius has surpassed even my conception of it now um have you heard many many of his works fred i've tried to hear every possible thing i could yeah and i have traveled to hear Dead Man Walking in different cities, even though I've seen it and heard it, and it's supposed right. to come to the Met, we hope, next season with Joyce Di Donato as Sister Helen. I know that you were originally considered to be the Sister Helen, 
and you decided to do instead Joseph de Rocher's mother. Well, and the, yeah. why did you pass on Sister Helen? At the time, I was becoming more aware of my limitations. I've always been very good at, at knowing them. Um, but I was, was so impressed. I didn't know Joyce yet, but I was always, I'm a huge fan of Susie Graham's. And As am I. I, yeah. I just felt it needed to be someone whose career was going to go on for 20 more years, which it certainly has. Um, and so Jakey said, well, would you like to be in it? And I said, oh, of course I want to be in it. I just love it. And he said, would you play one of the parents of the, the kids that are, are murdered? And I said, I, if, if you have, if the mother from the film is going to be in it, which she was very briefly in the film, I would love to be the mother if that's possible. So of course, Jake and Terrence wrote just about the best scenes that could have been conceived for this role. Yep. I, I, I felt, I mean, I couldn't get through it for a long time just from learning it. Um, and it taught me so much about my motherhood. It taught me that there's times when you you can't control your kids' futures. And you also have to realize that you have made decisions that have hurt them. Um, and this poor mother, you know, who was strapped in poverty and trying to maintain some sort of a life for her, for her younger children, um, you know, lost control, so to speak. So I just... I loved every minute of it so much because it, it sort of taught me to realize that and, and what I, the things that I have done and also a little bit to forgive myself, to begin forgiving myself. You know, you, you just, you make mistakes. You know, the, you know the word that seems to have disappeared from our repertoire of, of communication in the last 15 years is I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. If when you think of it, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. And that's why I loved the concept that my kids grew up with about confession in the Catholic Church is you made a mistake. You didn't just sin, you know, <laughs> what mm -hmm. you ate meat on Friday, you know. You made a mistake and you're sorry about the mistake. Um, and I just talked to Sister Helen a couple of days ago because one of her her wonderful beloved people that she's worked with was was um, a woman. No, no, it was a man. It was a young man. But I know there's another one. Unfortunately, as it's, we're talking, may I, happen or not. But it's a woman this time as this well. Was a, a young man who has been in prison for about four years, and he was part of a crime that kidnapped two older people, and he didn't pull the trigger, but he was part of the crime, and. Um, she said to me, it was only Sister Helen Wood, you know, he was so tortured and beleaguered by his regret and his remorse that I fear he would have had an impossible life. So I choose to believe that he's free from that now, you know. But ain't it awful? Darn, we've got to get rid of the capital punishment in this yep. country. It's obscene. I would like for our listeners who may not know the story to tell just a little oh, bit of yeah. the story. Um, Sister Helen Prejean is a real person. Thank God she's still very much with us, who is in Louisiana and who ministered. Louisiana, by the way, is a very large Catholic state relative to the rest of the South, so that there's a particular Catholic culture there that goes back to the French when France occupied new orleans and created new orleans and therefore it's a little different from the rest of the american south and she would minister to men mostly and occasionally women on death row who had been accused of murder or found guilty of murder and one of them was a man with a good louisiana named joseph de rocher and he committed murders and rape and and without a doubt and 
they made a film of that with Susan Sarandon and Sean Penn as Sister Helen and Joseph de Roche. And what opera does so incredibly well, although it's a magnificent film, is the music makes you feel things that the words in a film just can't do. And to me, one of the great parts of that opera is when Sister Helen has an awakening, namely that she is there to counsel and defend and support the the accused and, the, and those found guilty. But she discovered that the parents who lost their children were had a point too. Right. And whether killing the man who killed their children is a point that in America we discuss for decades, although now the United States is gradually going toward fewer uh, examples of capital punishment, except in the last phase of the Donald Trump administration. But right. for the most part, we're slowly too late moving away from that. Um, Italy, on the other hand, has not had capital punishment for many, many years. And the different popes, I remember John Paul II specifically, there was a girl named Paula Cooper in Indiana who had murdered, killed someone, perhaps accidentally, perhaps not, when she was a teenager. And Indiana wanted to put her to death. And I remember Pope John Paul II tried to intercede. Unfortunately, Paula Cooper was put to death. I, I'm not a believer in the death penalty. But yeah. um, that this story could become what I think is the greatest contemporary opera mm -hmm says uh -huh. so much about what opera is, what uh, Jake Hagee is, and Terrence McNally, who we lost to COVID last year, was. But um, it's an opera that holds up no matter who's in it. I've seen Susan Graham now play Mrs. De Roche. Right. And other women play Sister Helen, most recently Joyce Di Donato. Right. Um, Michael Mays, who you probably you do know because you were in great Scott with him. Oh, is and, a wonderful and, and exponent. Too, yeah. Okay, he's a wonderful exponent of that role. I had him on in, in the summer. And he and Joyce sang it in the London premiere. It came late to the UK. And it was sensational. I sent all my British friends to see it. They were doubtful. Yeah. But it's the most moving experience of contemporary opera in my in my view. I could not agree more. I, I even did it in Vienna. Really? In English, um, you know, years ago, but it is. And you know, when it first came to San Francisco opera, there was very, people were up in arms. You know, how many times you go to the opera and start with a rape, murder, and end with an execution? You know, it isn't exactly- Well, that's like Rigoletto. That. <laughs> That's right. um, but it it made people think and and I agree with you that because of the music and the great libretto it all it just fits in exactly the right way and I've seen many productions and I couldn't agree more I think it is the great American opera I do want to ask you about one other role before we conclude because it was so very beautiful, and I hope that this opera gains more attention, called Sky on Swings, that I saw you do in Philadelphia with Marietta Simpson, a wonderful oh, artist. Yeah. And your character was named Danny. The composer is Lembert Beecher, if I recall. Right. And would you talk about that opera somewhat? So beautiful. Oh, I love that opera. I loved it the most because of working with Marietta, because she is one in a million. That that woman has one of the most glorious voices I've ever heard, and she steps on a stage, and you just can't resist her. And I am a big fan of Lembet, and in spite of the fact that I think it took me a week to learn the first two pages, because it's it's quite, why, 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 you know, it's one of those, and I'm not that gifted in that area. It was fascinating, and the reason I accepted the lovely invitation to do it was because my aunt um, had very advanced Alzheimer's in, and lived in Philadelphia. And even at one point, one of the doctors from the Alzheimer's hospital there came and spoke to us. Um, but Hannah Moscovich, who did the, the libretto, 
is so brilliant. And we had an unbelievable directress, too, uh, Joanna, uh, I'm sorry, just brilliant. And she made the point that we are not, this is not a documentary. This is not a, a notice of what happens. What is, what is what happens look like? And so we are here to tell a story. And the story is not about Alzheimer's. It's about two women. And it's a love story. There are two women who meet in a, in a, um, a facility that treats patients with Alzheimer's. One is quite advanced. I play a woman who is, you know, a real go-getter and furious that she, her mind is going because she was, um, an, an educator, I mean, that's her field, and so she's very resistant to it all. And it's really about their relationship and how it develops. But it's also about the develop their relationship with their children. And I have a quite a, a, a sympathetic son, but it's, it's a hard choice for any child to make about your parent. And Marietta has a, a less patient daughter, but an equally devoted and for me the magic started happening when we brought in the the extra people on stage first of all it has a, a quartet of singers that i've never heard in my life they are fantastic and they provide the musical noise that happens in your head with alzheimer's but it's beautiful and it's beautifully written and the script is incredible but the first time we made, I made an entrance on stage with other patients in this facility, supposedly, I, my heart just started just pounding. One, from comfort, because they were mostly my contemporaries. <laughs> but two, these are the people that are like, it's likely to affect at some point in their lives. And oh, it was just, it was a really magic experience. And um, Lembit is doing an opera out here that's being produced by Opera Parallel, and it's going to be performed in, uh, in the cathedral, in, not the Catholic cathedral, in, uh, in San Francisco. And I'm so excited about it, because I've seen a couple of his other operas. He's also written about the most difficult song I've ever heard for a soprano. I'll try and find it for you, Fred, and send it okay. to you. It's like, you know, and he's really, he's, a, he's the dearest human you'd ever want to know, too. I think that we could continue at Wagnerian lengths, but you're not a Wagner singer. <laughs> Let's cook instead. <laughs> Let's cook instead. What a wonderful way to start the new year, Frederica von Stata. Thank you. Thank you for everything you've given us for decades, us today, me for years, me today. You made a comment about Victoria de los, de los Angeles that I'm going to turn back on you. The voice matches her face and her heart. Thank you. And it's true. Thank you. You, you are a national treasure. You're an international treasure, but we're proud to have you as an American. Listen, do your best to keep going as long as you can. We need you so much on this planet, not just musicians, but humans, okay? Just Thank keep you. on trekking, keep on doing this. And have a wonderful, productive, artistic, happy, creative 2021. You too. Thank Bless you. Bless you a thousand times. Thank you. God bless and thanks, Johan. Thank you.